This is Your Own Best Company, a podcast and community for creative people who value and enjoy working alone. Welcome, everybody, to Your Own Best Company. This is a podcast and a community that is for people who enjoy working alone. And my guest today is, um, I can't even begin to describe what Steve Hoffman is. <laughs> um, looking at his resume, we could spend half an hour just talking through all of the different points on the resume. But I'll give you a real brief introduction. Um, Steve is the captain and CEO of Founderspace, one of the world's leading startup accelerators. Founderspace was ranked the number one incubator for overseas startups by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. He's also a venture investor, serial entrepreneur, and author of several award-winning books, including Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. He's been a TV development executive, producing over a hundred TV shows. He's been a pioneer in interactive television producing, uh, interactive TV shows with NBC, MTV, Turner, Warner Brothers, History Channel, and The Game Show Network, among others. He's been a driver in the digital and mobile gaming industries for decades now. He launched Founder Space with a mission to educate and accelerate entrepreneurs. Um, Steve also hosts two podcasts of his own, Captain Hoff's Adventures and Founder's Space Podcast. So Steve, I don't know when you'd find time to eat or sleep in the midst of all of the things that you're doing. <laughs> Well, I like to say I've had more careers than cats have had lives. So I've done a lot of different stuff. One correction to your oh, okay. bio. It wasn't a hundred TV shows. Oh, okay. I, I have actually produced close to 100 interactive products, everything from oh. games to uh, interactive apps. Very good. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot about the startup today. Um, your experience as, uh, as a startup founder, just it really, it blows my mind the things that you've, you've accomplished. And a lot of the folks that uh, I am working with and a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are just now starting for the first time to find their way into the business world. And so we're going to take some of your expertise and some of your insight and bring it to them and say, here are some things that are going to help you along the way and maybe some things to avoid as well. Does that sound like a plan? I can talk all about that. <laughs> awesome. Well, the first thing I'd like to, to talk a little bit about is um, in your book, um, Surviving the Startup or Surviving a Startup, um, this was published by HarperCollins. Um, just reading the table of contents is almost a, a bachelor's degree education in business. <laughs> but one of the things that you really hit on in there that I, that I keyed in on was uh, around business models. Can you talk a little bit about what a business model is and why it's important uh, to uh, a new business or to a one person company? Give us a little bit of insight. Business models are important for anybody going into business. And a business model, for those who don't understand, is very simple. So it is basically, how are you going to get your money? Like, how are people going to pay you? What are you going to offer them in return? So in there are basically two fundamental types of business models. One, where the customer pays you directly. So you sell a product or a service and the customer pays you. The other business model is where you get indirect payments. We usually call this advertising or sponsorship. So the advertiser is, ba the customer is basically paying for an ad on your network and you're getting paid through the ad network. Now, if you are trying to figure out what business model works for you, that's the key. So it's really about, can you make money in this business? And the way you do that is the biggest cost most businesses have is acquiring new customers. You know, if they advertise, market, do anything like that, how much does it cost to get them to get a customer to walk in the door? And once that customer becomes your customer, 
how much money are you going to make over the life of your relationship with that customer? We call this the lifetime value. Now, if the lifetime value, the amount the customer is going to pay you over their lifetime working with you, the profit from that is significantly higher than you would spend acquiring the customer, you have a profitable business. That's as simple as it gets, isn't it? That's what I try to do. I try to take complex concepts and actually make them so simple. You're like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> That's amazing. One of the things that I loved about the Founder Space website is all the resources that you have on the website that are educational and just a, a ton of really great information, very much like what you're sharing today. And um, talk to me a little bit about um, what what are some of the things that people need to consider when they are creating their business model? Um, you mentioned the, you know, the, the costs of marketing, but what are some other really important things for people to consider as they create their business model? One important thing is how are the customers going to pay you? How are you going to deliver your products and services? Mm -hmm. Now, if your products and services require your time, every time the customer walks in the door, you have to invest your time to service them then your time is limited. So when we say this, uh, this means that you only have so many hours a day to work. So you better be charging your customers enough money so that it's worth your time because you <laughs> literally uh, can only take so many customers. Of that business is what we typically call a non-scalable business. It doesn't scale beyond your time. And maybe if you bring in some other people, well, then their time, but you have to pay them. Scalable businesses, ones that can get much bigger, they don't require your time. You can automate the process. And a typical way that this is done these days is a website or an app. Like they can come into your website. You don't need to talk to your customer. They can figure everything out and they can get the product or service themselves, self-serve. And you just collect the money. Then you could take Literally, if you have enough a web hosting like Amazon, you could take millions of customers. It, it, your product or service scales. So that's the second concept uh, your listeners need to understand. And technology just offers so many different ways that scaling can happen, uh, which is an exciting frontier. It's also um, somewhat overwhelming and terrifying sometimes. <laughs> but there's there are so many options now for automation. It's just... Uh, it's crazy to think about. Um, do you have any tools that are kind of go-to for you for business model development? For business model development, it's not that hard. I mean, business model development is really comes down to when you put together your business plan, when you're okay. writing your business plan. And if you, the, the fundamentals, you could probably grasp yourselves, like what product or service are you making? Who are your customers? You know, identifying them very clearly so you know who to target. How are you going to reach them? Um, you don't need a lot. I mean, I tell, you know, one pe person companies, whoever is out there that wants to start their business, I tell them, keep things simple. There's no reason to get complex software and all this stuff to do something that could be pretty simple. You yeah. can use MS Word and uh, a spread or, you know, Google Docs, uh, uh, kind of spread a Word document and a spreadsheet. And yeah. literally that's enough to create your basic business model and you can move from there. What, the, what your listeners may lack is the experience to put one together. And in that case, I say, get an advisor, you know, get somebody who's done this before, who's seen businesses like yours, who knows what works, what doesn't work, get them to come in as a consultant and help you put this together. This is where I can plug the SBDC. <laughs> I'm a consultant for the local SBDC, and that is something that we do help people with is business model and business planning. So if you are looking for some low cost and no cost help, SBDC is a great place to start. I'm really curious um, about research for businesses, because I think one of the things that I see a lot is that people come in with a really great idea, but they don't have they don't really have an adequate knowledge base about the market that they're entering, and they don't have an adequate knowledge base about the industry that they're that they're a part of, and that kind of that sets them up that sets them up for some real difficulties in their startup. Can you talk a little bit about 
what kinds of research do people really need to do well when they're starting a business? There are a few things your audience should focus on when they're beginning a business. These are the most important things. Mm -hmm. So I say, if there's a new industry that you want to dive into, you shouldn't let that necessarily stop you because a lot of the most successful people in the world and companies that you hear about, they didn't necessarily know a lot about that business when they dove in. They actually learned it along the way. And because of that, they started breaking rules that that business usually does. And that actually, their, their ignorance gave them an advantage. They weren't constrained by what everybody else was doing. They're like, well, we could do it differently. And there's this new technology or this new tool we could use to actually deliver more value to the customer. Yeah. That is one thing. The other thing is, what should you do first? Like you're thinking of starting a business, where do you begin? Well, I always say, don't begin with what's in your head. Like whatever idea is in your head is just an idea in your head. It may be great, it may not be great, but you honestly don't know. You just, you probably think it's great because it's your baby, your idea, and you want to believe in it, but you need to keep an open mind and you need to begin to test out this idea. What you're looking for is external validation, not internal, not yourself saying, oh, this is the best idea ever, or your friends agreeing with you because they're going to agree with you if you go out to beers or whatever. They're going to say, oh, that sounds really cool. What you want is your customers. Who are your potential customers? Who is actually going to pay you money for this idea? Yeah. And do they think it's an amazing idea? Are they, you know, I honestly say, to anybody who's thinking of starting a business, go out, find a hundred potential customers and talk to them. If they all say, wow, that's nice. Come back later when it's ready. You know, at that point that you are going to fail because everybody will tell you that's nice. Come back later. It's a way of getting rid of you. They don't <laughs> want to deal with you bothering them about your business. So they're polite. That's nice. Come back later when it's ready. And they just want to move on. What you really need to hear to know that you have something is when customers turn to you and say, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, can I have it now? What can I do to get it? Can I give you some money? Can I be the first one? If you hear those words, you probably have something. And especially if you hear those words from multiple people over and over, you get a pattern. Doesn't have to be everybody. Not everybody's going to go crazy over your idea. Yeah. But you have to look out there and say, are there enough of these people out there in my market to get me where I need to go? That's, uh, that's such great information. And one of the things that I often tell people is to not create their business in a vacuum. You know, don't do this from the ivory tower where you don't have any connection with the, you know, with the customers that you're ultimately going to reach. Be in conversation with your customers from the beginning. Um, I love that advice, and I think that that's really on target. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit curious. Um, do you have any kind of go-to places where you interact with your customers uh, at the front end of a, a project like that? So are you talking me at Founderspace where I do it for my business or where uh, entrepreneurs would do it or one-person company founders would do it? I'm actually curious where you would do it. So for me. Yeah, I run a startup incubator accelerator, yeah. and that means my customers are people who are launching companies, new people, you know, typical entrepreneurs who are coming to me and saying, you know, I have this idea. I want to do this. How do I engage them? So basically, uh, we at, at the beginning, when I first started, you know, I went face to face. I actually went out and first talked to my friends who were thinking of starting businesses and listened to all their problems and the questions they had and started to realize, oh, I could actually help them with that. And my business didn't begin as starting an incubator, which is like a physical space where we nurture startups, we bring them together, we educate them. It started literally as a blog. So I would just help my friends by researching stuff and posting it on the blog. And then other people started to come to me. The more people that came to me and started to say, oh, there's something here. They, a lot of people need this help right now. This was over a decade ago. So it was yeah. a while back. The people started to come to me. I was in Silicon Valley and I learned from them what they needed. The first thing they needed was like, 
How do I do a business plan? How do I do an investor deck? How do I reach out to investors? What are the legal requirements? How do I set up a company? All the different questions they had. How do I market? So I started to bring in experts from all these things because I can't be an expert on everything, right. but I could be the facilitator. So I bring in experts, we do these round tables, get them together, the people starting the businesses with the people with the knowledge and they would exchange. And then uh, the people, my clients basically said, can't we have a physical space where we, where we meet and we grow and we learn? So that's when we set up our actual startup incubator and accelerator, which is a physical space. We would run programs, we would bring in mentors, we'd bring in all these industry experts, and we would basically, it's like a crash course in, co in college, like a crash MBA course, but specifically focused on people launching businesses. And that's what our service was. And we figured it out step by step. Yeah. So it just grew from idea to idea to idea and from need to need to need. As customers said, this is what we need. You were able to find a way to respond to that. It, yeah. It didn't matter what I thought I should be delivering or what I thought I would be doing. You know, you can be, I like to say, you can be as passionate as you know possible about your idea, but that doesn't mean it will go anywhere. Like yeah. it's not how passionate you are. It's how passionate your customer is. Like, do are they crazy about your idea? If they're crazy, then your business will take off. I love it. You know, in the work that you do with uh, with founders, um, a lot of them are going to be looking for money, and a lot of folks that I work with also are in a place where, you know, most of them are boot, bootstrapping. They're they're using their own savings, their own money to invest. And I'm kind of curious if somebody were to look outside of their own resources um, as a one person business in particular, do you have any thoughts about where would be good places for them to start to look for funding? There are a lot of places you can get funding. Now, a lot of investors like to see teams of people. So if mm -hmm. you're a one person company, you need to consider what direction you want to go you definitely don't want to take money from a, uh, an investor that expects you to grow an organization if you are committed to being a one-person company because there's a disconnect there. Your investor isn't going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. Recipe for disaster. Yeah. So you have to make that clear. Most uh, See, investors, when an investor gives you the money, the first thing the investor wants is the money back but not what they gave you, like twice as much, three times as much, 10 times as much. They want to get a lot of money out of your company as quickly as possible. That's what investors want. So they don't want necessarily what you want. They might not want a steady, slow growing, dependable company. They want something that's going to go crazy. And then, you know, it will be acquired for lots of money or IPO. And that is a very different type of business than a one person company. Mm -hmm. One pe pe person companies do not IPO. It just doesn't happen. They no. seldom, if ever, get acquired. So a one person company, you have to be clear about your goals before you talk to investors. You have to say, look, I'm doing this business because I, I care about it. The, and I don't want to be in a large organization. I definitely don't want to be managing a lot of people. If that isn't what you want, most likely you're not going to be happy with investors and yeah. they're not going to be happy with you because what you each want is fundamentally different. If on the other hand, you do want those things, then going to investors is a whole nother story, but we're going to keep this focused on one person companies. Yeah. So for one person companies, the people who might invest in you, for example, might be your family. So it could be they care about you. They're not doing it to get the money back. In fact, they are gifting you the money. Yeah. And they may do it as a loan. They may actually just give it to you as a gift. That's great. If you take money from friends and family, it's a risky thing because the majority of businesses don't work out. Like people think they're going to work out, but something comes along and it just doesn't work out. So I am very reluctant to recommend that you do take money from friends and family unless there are certain conditions applied. Mm -hmm. And that means that you are totally upfront with them that they're not getting their money back. Like, see, the chance of me actually giving your money back is very small because businesses are risky. 
I don't know what I'm doing yet. I'm going to be figuring this out, but I really do need the help. And if you don't mind like gifting me the money, great. And if I can pay you back someday, I will. But if I can't, which is probably the case, I won't. If you lay it out that clearly, well, then uh, that is fair because you've set their expectations. Uh, you are very clear that they're not getting their money back. And if they do, they'll be happy. And if they don't, they won't be mad. Yeah. And that is what I recommend. I'm, I'm a little bit curious, have any of your startups used crowdfunding to raise money at the, at the very beginning stage? This is another approach that you can take. Now, crowdfunding has its pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. So most crowdfunding is used for companies that are delivering a product. They are still, they tend not to be because it's, or it's complicated to make the product. A lot of them tend to be multi-person companies. So, because it's just a lot of logistics, especially if they're manufacturing something, you know, you go to Indiegogo and Kickstarter, a, a lot of them are putting up a new invention that they did. Yeah. Now, if you want to do a one person company, then you need to think very carefully because when you start taking money from a crowd, they also have expectations. They are yeah. giving you their money. They want whatever you're promising them. And if you fail to deliver it, they will not be happy and you will be setting yourself up for a lot of conflicts in the future with these potential investors. Now, these investors on crowdfunding, it's not really that they're investing in your company, like buying shares in your company. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is in most cases, literally uh, funding you because they care about what you do. So that's more like a donation yeah. or they are funding you because they want that product. And they want it within a reasonable time frame, which puts you under some pressure. So consider these. Do you want that pressure from them? Are, what commitment are you making them? Can you give that commitment? Can you still remain a one-person company and actually deliver the product or service they're expecting? Yeah. If all the answers are yes, you know, you can do all these things and it matches with what the crowd is expecting, again, that's a good fit. That's actually a great way for a one person company to do it. So if you're, let's say, you're somebody who is going to write a great novel and you have this idea that it has to be written and you are crowdfunding so you can live during the time you're writing that novel. And a lot of other people want that novel written because they think, oh, nobody's told that story. We really want it. And they're willing to give you the money to do it by all means. You could do that as a one person company. Same if you're gonna make like a, a, a documentary and you can do editing and sound and everything else yourself. Yeah great, do it. Or you're a coder and you can code a game and there are a lot of people out there who want the game and you know you can make this whole game yourself, maybe with a few people helping out at art like as contractors. Do it. Those are uh, things that you should do. If you are promising them that you are going to manufacture a physical product you know, and, and design all the stuff and ship it out and do all that, that may be too much. Yeah. So you have to think about that. Crowdfunding is a viable option to look into if, diff if delivery is difficult or if it requires, you know, expansion beyond what you're ready to, to, to do, maybe it's not the best option. In, in our first email exchange, you mentioned the, the company Lava Mind that you and your wife started. I don't know how long ago. How long ago was that? That was uh, many decades ago. It's, okay. it's been around a while. It was the first company I ever founded. And oh, yes, man. it was. We did it. It was a labor of love. Now, Lava Mind was a software company, and, and, and basically, as I understand it, the things that I see as products that you, you developed were educational games. Um, and I was telling you that my son actually still plays one of the games from your company at the school that he attends in the entrepreneurship class. That um, is amazing because those <laughs> games, as I said, are many decades old. It, but it's the beautiful thing about doing something yourself where you own it and control it, first of all, you can make it whatever you want. You don't have yeah. to answer to anybody. So we, I had this vision for nonviolent games that teach people how to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. So we literally, the two of us just made these games ourselves. Like I was coding and writing and she was doing the artwork, really fun experience because it was our baby. And then we put it out into the world. And surprisingly, it did incredibly well. It got published by a big publisher, went to all the stores. After that, it found a new home in schools and universities all around the world. So, and surprisingly, because it was our own, 
it's still going. You can go to lavamind.com, get all the games we ever made, and we made a lot. And you know, there's one, the very first baby was called Gazillionaire. Yeah. And Gazillionaire teaches you how to become a gazillionaire in a fun <laughs> way. Very fun. It's it's really entertaining. So people love it. Adults love it. You know, kids love it. Every families actually play together. So this game, uh, we basically created. it. It took us nine months. And then we have hardly made any changes yeah. in many years that passed. Wow. Yet people still love it because the beautiful thing about doing like a small company, a company that's all yours, is that you can be as you can put your real everything into it. You don't have to hold anything back. So we made the game really funny, really weird. And people, even though the graphics are dated yeah. and people fall in love with it, they just and the game mechanics are really good. So people like just want to keep playing and playing and playing. <laughs> so that was our game. It still lives today. And if your audience is out there with those ideas that they want to do, that they passionately want to do. Don't think you can't do them alone. Yeah. You may have to learn some new skills. Like we didn't know anything about, you know, what we were doing. We just figured it out along the way. I'm really curious um, what, what 2021 Steve would say to the beginning of Lava Mind Steve uh, as, as he started his new company with his wife. Uh, way back when. Are there any pieces of advice that you can look at in hindsight that would have been valuable back then? I would honestly say when I was doing that company, I felt like, how can I as an individual compete with these big game companies? I mean, they have mil they are pumping millions of dollars into their games. Like these are huge budget things. How will my product, anybody find it or care about it? And I was worried about that. Like, yeah. I was like, am I just wasting my time? But I want to create this. I want to make this. So I just went ahead and did it. But I had this anxiety. I would tell myself today, looking back, of course, with hindsight, don't worry about it. Like, you know, if you really are passionate, if you put yourself into something and other people will respond, you will find people out there. That is the beauty of the Internet. You know, the yeah. internet is you can reach the whole world. And we literally had millions of people playing this all around the world, just creating it ourselves from our home. So I encourage everybody out there, if you want to do something yourself, just do it and put it out there in yeah. a way you have nothing to lose but your time. As you look back on that experience, I mean, all of the things that you've done started there and what what amazes me is the diverse the diverse opportunities that have come your way through the years and again you're going back to the same thing about how founder space evolved and it's like it started with blog articles and then it turned into different things that you were offering along the way and different experts that you would bring in on different topics um how how did how did Lava Mind open the door for these kinds of opportunities for you? It opened the doors in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So first of all, when you're doing your own business, you have to learn a lot. And when we were doing this, the internet was just, it was like the early nineties, the yeah. internet was just launching. So naturally we're like, well, we're making this game and how are we going to get it to people? And the, our, the first thing we did was we uploaded it not to the web because nobody was using the web. We uploaded it to what was called a bulletin board. Oh, yeah. And we put it up there and we waited for somebody to download it. Now you could get the free version, but if you wanted the full version, you had to send us money. Yeah. And we waited and all of a sudden the first check came in the mail, literally in the mail, not email, what? real mail, paper <laughs> check. And it was $15 from a guy called Lord Geck. Now you can imagine <laughs> who was on these bulletin boards, right? They were not your average people. They were the Lord Gecks of the world, the yeah. real geeks out there. And you know, he mailed it, we looked at it and he was from like the Bay Area where we were. So yeah. we actually invited him over to our house for dinner. Like we're talking with Lord Geck, you know, he's our first customer. We're so happy we made $15. <laughs> that is how it began. And, but 
it started to teach me like, we're like, how can we reach more people? What are we doing? Then the internet just started to come into being the web. We were one of the first people to put up a website, get it up there, start e-commerce. How do we figure out e-commerce? Oh, we have to learn all these things. How do we process payments? You, and then we had a big publisher, their whole testing team started to play our game and fell in love with it. Like they were crazy over it. So they called us up and they wanted to publish because they were producing Star Trek at the time, the Star Trek game. And it was, they were the largest PC game publisher and their Star Trek was delayed. So they need to pick up another game so they could book revenue before the end of the year. So they were like, they were all over us. And we said, we will give it to you, but this is our baby. And we want to own all the future rights to it. Like you don't own anything. Very unusual when you go to a publisher wow. for games. But because they needed it to fill this gap, because their big project was delayed, they just gave us everything we wanted. So we that's why we own it today. We never sold it. We swore we had never do it because it was our labor of love. Every step of the way, how do you negotiate a publishing deal? Didn't know. We figured out all of that. We got a lawyer and literally we went over the contract with the lawyer. We learned how to do publishing contracts so that we could now today, we do lots of deals at Founderspace. A lot of them, we're not lawyers, but we write our own contracts. Like we know this stuff. Like, so everything you touch, you have the opportunity to learn more about. And that will help you with whatever, whatever wherever life takes you, whatever crazy path life takes you on. One of the things you've, you've written three books here, at least, um, I don't know if you've written others, but these are the three that are mentioned on your website. Um, and I'm curious about these books. Um, talk to me a little bit. The one that really jumped out at me, of course, was surviving a startup, but I'm also, uh, one of the things that, um, had happened, I, I realized that I had heard you on a podcast talking about the five forces and I don't, I don't have the time frame for when that was. It, it's sometime within probably the last year or two years, but I'm really curious about your books. Um, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. Can you just give us a little overview of each and where they came from, where the inspiration was? And um, I started yeah. with Make Elephants Fly, and that okay. was actually not my first book. My first book was Game Design Workshop because I designed all these games. Yeah. So it was all about game design. My later book, which came out was Make Elephants Fly. It's not that old, it's still pretty new. And that is all about the process of innovation. So I've been working with entrepreneurs and creative people doing innovation for decades now. And I wanted to take all that learning from, especially from people who are much smarter than I, who had gone through the process and distill it down so that people with their elephant. The elephant is that big idea that you have in your head that seems impossible to get it off the ground. It seems yeah. impossible to make it fly. How can you get that off the ground? So that was make elephants fly. After that, and it was just during this COVID that we've had, I sat down because I had plenty of time because of COVID, took yeah. advantage of that and wrote surviving a startup. Because I work with so many entrepreneurs, because I've done so many companies myself, I know what it's like. I know how hard it is and from doing big companies to small companies, all the different things, all the headaches you encounter. I wanted to take that knowledge and really crystallize it, and make it easy for people to understand. And so I just put all my knowledge into there about yeah. being an entrepreneur. Then after that, COVID was still going on because it's going on longer than we expected. I have been very fascinated for years in researching new technologies. Uh, technologies about AI, about gene editing, nanotechnology, space travel, all of these things fascinate me. I'm always reading about it. So I wanted to do a book about and that would force me to think and talk to experts around the world mm -hmm. about how this technology is going to affect the future of humanity. Like, what is this technology going to do to us? Is What decisions do we have to make moving forward? Yeah. So this book looks at the five core forces of technology, you know, deep automation or AI doing automation, the technology around biotech convergence, you know, we're actually, you know, with CRISPR and gene editing, creating new species of plants and animals, all of these different technologies. What type of world are we going to be living in 10, 20, 30 years from now? And wh what decisions that we make now will profoundly affect humanity? Yeah. So the, I 
tried to write a very balanced book, not super pro rah rah technology, yeah. not super anti technology, but really weighing and balancing very critical issues. For example, you're in the world today and AI is everywhere. Yeah. We are using AI to make decisions like what movie to watch, what restaurant to eat at. You know, these AI apps will be helping us with everything we do. Yeah. But at some point, they're going to get really good. And when you want to, let's say, start a company, your one person company, yeah. you won't talk to me in the future. You will probably go to an AI and say, you know, with my skill sets, you've been analyzing me. Am I good enough to do this? Or which you know, type of business should I focus on? Which one has the most potential? Because that AI will have massive data out there yeah. about all the other people starting similar businesses and be able to distill it down for you much better than a human being could. The scary part is, and what I try to talk about, is when this happens, will you be delegating all of our key decision-making, life decision-making to AI? Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, implications are kind of scary. <laughs> and that's just one of many. You know, I talk yeah. about brain chips in your brain. Like you could imagine if you put a, like Elon Musk wants to have every individual with a brain chip. Yeah. I'm not so sure that's a great idea. Like, it's one thing for somebody, like we see all these uh, spyware attacks, these ransomware attacks. It's yeah. one thing to have a ransomware attack on your bank account. But it's another thing for somebody to uh, ransomware your brain. Like, yeah. literally, I'm going to rewrite your brain. If they have a chip in there that can go two-way communication, it's a very scary world. Who do you trust? All these things. We're going to be like gene editing technology literally today. You can, people have been working, you can start to design new species of plants and animals. Well, what are human beings? We're an animal. Like if they can make a cow, which they're doing now at the University of Florida, that can resist climate change, can stand much higher heat, they can start to alter human, like your intelligence, your features, all of these things with gene editing. That yeah. will be around in our lifetime, most of our lifetime. What decisions will we make? What will the human race become? These fascinate me, like I could go on forever. On a personal level, how do you, how do you, so efficiently produce all of this work? I am Focus. goal oriented. <laughs> so my my modus operandi has been to set goals for myself yeah. and then see them through. So if, instead of a lot of people dream like, oh, I'm going to start this company or oh, I'm going to do this, but then they don't take the necessary steps to actually do it. Yeah. So what I do is. If I feel passionate about something, then I, re I commit. And that one thing becomes all encompassing for me. I just go all in on that one thing. I focus. So yeah. I push aside all the other things I could be doing because there are always a million things that you can procrastinate on. You can take your yeah. time on and just laser focus on that and put all my energy. And then I just keep doing that. And even if it's hard, I don't stop. Like, yeah. You'll hit points when whatever you do, it feels hopeless. Like you'll never finish this project. You'll never get it off the ground. You just keep going, knowing that the only alternative is to give up. And how would you feel then? Like you're going to feel worse than the pain you're actually feeling pushing this through. Yeah. It's actually a worse feeling when you give up on something. So just push it through, get it into the world and see how the world reacts. Now, are your, is your ability to... Uh... Uh, to push away distractions, is that a discipline or is that something that you, you have tools for? I am actually a very easily distracted person because I'm interested in everything. Yeah. So anything can get my interest and I would be like, oh, that's amazing. Why don't I do this? And I always find myself committing to too many things yeah. and then unfortunately having to back out of a lot of those and focus and narrow my focus. Yeah. The, you can say there are tools. I mean, you, there are certain software packages that can actually help you. But at the end of the day, it's you. Like, yeah. it's you. You have to look at yourself and say, I always say, what are you capable of doing really well? What are your passions? Find the intersection for these. Like, I'm passionate about this. I'm actually decent at this, you know, and I could get better at that. And then uh, what you need to do, the tools I use are almost anti-technology. Like, I have no notifications on my computer or my phone, like Smart. literally, uh, you know, text messages don't beep. They come in, I get text messages, but they don't make noise and they don't even show a little red number. Like yeah. I don't want those because that red number is as bad as the noise. You have to touch it. <laughs> so all my apps, like there's no prompts for me to go to them. I go to them on my own time. Like right. th that's what I do. 
when I do my email, like I, you have to set aside time to do your email and you can't multitask between things. Like if you're going to do something like write a book or code a game or, you know, build, write a business plan, whatever your goal is, if you have, are, are checking email all the time, it's going to distract you. You're not going to do a good job. You're yeah. gonna, and, and the email is a vortex. It'll suck you into all sorts of thing, other things you have to do. So literally block off your time, like yeah. set times like, okay, this is the time where I do email. This is a time where I browse the web and do research. This is the time where I sit and I actually focus on getting this project done yeah. and nothing. And I'm putting aside my phone. I'm, you know, all my notifications on my computer off. That's what I'm doing. That's amazing. You don't need yeah. any special process or hard technology. You just need rules that you commit to following. It's simple, but effective. <laughs> yes. <laughs> simple, effective, and sometimes very hard to actually do. I'd love to hear about your podcasts. You have two podcasts and what brought us together originally was that we uh, connected through a, a podcast networking group. Um, tell us about your podcasts. Uh, both of them sound really, really interesting. Thank you. So one of them, if you like hearing me talk, if you like lessons, it's all about lessons that I have developed for founder space and I've made those free, right? So they're basically, me taking you through all the different steps you need to do. And that is called the Founder Space Podcast. It's out there. We are uh, uploading different lessons every week and you can tune in and find you know new content there. The other one is Captain Hoff's Adventures. <laughs> and I believe life should be an adventure. I've, you know, I believe people should always be pushing themselves, trying new things, going places. So I interview people who are doing this, like people with deep knowledge, you know, they're real, they have a lot of expertise so they can help you along your adventure. People yeah. who are actually going out into the world with their projects and trying new things and what they're learning. So both of these are educational. One is me giving lectures, like all my learning. And another is where I engage with other people who have something valuable to share. For those of you who want to kind of, who are ambitious, you want to do things in your life, but you also want to make it fun. You want to make it an adventure, some a journey that you go on that you can feel really good about. Um, speaking of which, where does the where does the nickname Captain Hoff come from? Captain Hoff was my gamer handle, so oh, I was cool. totally into games, as you know, <laughs> creating them, playing them, doing that, and I just adopted it for my nickname because every you know when you're on when you're in a game, people are calling you Captain Hoff. That becomes yeah. your identity. So that's who I am. So your brand, there you are, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Steve, this has been so much fun. And I really just, I, I can't say how much I appreciate you sharing your insight here. It has been so valuable and really, really timely for a lot of folks and me included in that. Um, so I want to mention that people can find out more about you at founderspace.com. Um, there's also information about each of the three books that were mentioned today there and also just a, a ton of resources that I think will be valuable for entrepreneurs. Who are the people that need to find you, Steve? A lot of people come to me for many different reasons. So some people come to me just to learn. They want our free content. They want to learn stuff and they can be individuals. They could be even working in a corporate job, but thinking of doing something on their own, either a small business or a big business. Other people come to me uh, for services. So our incubator accelerator. So if you have a company that is, it's the type of companies we usually work with hands-on. So we will educate anybody. I believe in educating everybody because I believe education is so important. So it doesn't matter who you are, you can come to us and we'll give you all sorts of content like the podcast and everything else to help educate you. Right. If you want to join our accelerator where we actually invest in you time resources and even money well then we become much more selective because we have to be able to somehow recoup that, that investment and we're working with other investors too and they have all their criteria as i've yeah. told you so in that case you have to meet a certain standard and then if your business plan is good enough and your team is good enough then we will select you very cool well, thank you so much for your time today and for your the contributions that you're making. Too many to mention. It's just really amazing to hear you and to, to see what you're up to. So thank you for your time. Thank you. 
People who work alone aren't antisocial, at least not most of us. If people think you're weird because you don't want to grow a big company and you'd rather spend most of your time working by yourself, you're just hanging around the wrong people. Your own best company has a Facebook group that you're invited to join right now. We understand the urge to close the door, let your imagination run wild, and stay there until your creative impulse runs its course. We also understand the features and challenges that go along with running a business to support our solo flight lifestyles. Joining the group is free and it's as easy as clicking the link in the channel description. So go there now and just join the group. Want to hear more where this came from? Subscribe to your own best company on your favorite podcast app or on the Franklin Taggart Coaching and Consulting YouTube channel. To get in touch with Franklin, send an email to yobc at franklintaggart.com. Thanks for listening.